Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Over the years, we've had a great variety of guests and uh, I am very honored with our guest tonight. Uh, I, I often don't have the great privilege of a bishop joining me on the program. Our, our guest is Bishop Scott McCaig, former Presbyterian and Anglican, and he is the Bishop of the Military Ordinariate of Canada, right? Your Excellency, welcome to The Journey Home. It's wonderful to be here, yes. It's, it, it's great, and you and I crossed paths, right? We did, we, uh, we both were speakers at the Lift Jesus Higher Rally in Toronto uh, what, maybe five years ago, right. six years ago. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yes. that was a great privilege, and you weren't present but we were in your neck of the woods a number yes. of years ago when we did the last uh, Canadian uh, Journey Home programs. That's right? right. So our head office, I was the uh, serving as the general superior of the religious order, the Companions of the Cross, right. and uh, our our office space, if you will, has a chapel on the top floor, and you use that to to film. I think I was scheduled initially <laughs> to be on the show, but uh, I was on a, a mission in Africa at that time, so wow. I was unable to, uh, to do it, but here we are now. It's great to have you here, and I'm anxious to hear your story, so let me back off and start us from the beginning, if you Yeah, will. so I grew up in British Columbia, Canada, which is the westernmost province for anybody who's unaware, uh, just mm. sort of wash north of Washington State. And now, uh, if, if the French is the Quebec side, is, yes. is, is is that the, the least French over there? It's It would probably be the least French and the least religious province in Canada oh, as well. Okay. And uh, I reflected that, I think. Uh, my parents grew up in on Ontario, northwestern Ontario, um, and my brothers had both attended uh, uh, catechism class, Sunday school, all of that in the Presbyterian Church. I had been baptized Presbyterian, but uh, really didn't grow up with much faith formation mm. at all. Mm. You know, by the time I reached the age of reason, sports had eclipsed <laughs> anything religious in the household, you know, uh, two older brothers. So you can imagine there was an awful lot of sports being played. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So was it that your, your parents have not uh, had it to pass on? Or was it the mentality of that it's really his decision for himself? I think it's an unspoken assumption in the house that they were believers. Uh, at least in the existence of God. I wouldn't, you know, say they were fervent disciples yeah. of Jesus or anything like that. But it was a cultural faith that had been handed on. So I, I was raised with sort of an intuition that there was a God, uh, that he mattered, that he was there. But it wasn't something that influenced our daily life, you know. I can only remember actually ever being in a church once mm -hmm. as I was growing up. And it turned out it was a Catholic wedding mass. Uh, a cousin uh -huh. of mine... And uh, I, even then, you know, it's, it's quite comical. Uh, I remember sitting there and not knowing what was happening. And my brother leaned over and he says, you see, you see that priest up there? I said, yeah. He says, after we're done, he's got to drink all the wine that's left over. <laughs> so I guess even then I thought, hey, it's not a bad job, you know. <laughs> but, God uh, uses all kinds of ways to call absolutely, us. Absolutely, you know? <laughs> absolutely. You know, I was thinking, why is it that? And this is a, maybe a, a discussion for even more for the second part of the program, but you know, what's happened to the religious faith in mm -hmm. Canada, that, that land way up there, and what, what from our perspective, what, what's happened to it? And you know, it seems in some ways so different than what happened here in the mm -hmm. United States. But it, even as I was thinking that, I was wondering if, if what happened in Canada, which I really do want us to talk to it. Sure, sure. Would have happened here if we hadn't had a variety of evangelical Protestant renewals, Jonathan Edwards, these different times mm. that had these awakenings, the Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening from a Protestant standpoint, that I don't know if they ever made it up there. Right. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a piece of history that I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how much those great enlightenments influenced uh, what we then called Upper Canada, which is now Ontario right. and, uh, and west from there. Yeah, yeah, upper because you're looking at from the St. Lawrence River, yeah, right? Yeah, it's higher up the river. Yeah. 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 We always think of the Mississippi as the big river, but the St. Lawrence <laughs> yeah. is really, in many ways, more of the river that brought so many of us to yeah. this continent. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. So there you are, young man. Yeah. Not much faith. <clears throat> I didn't have much faith. As I say, I had sort of an intuition of, of God, but um, never thought about it deeply, never practiced the faith. I had some friends whose families attended church, but they ended up kind of drifting away as mm -hmm. well. 
So it wasn't a serious um, part of my life. I didn't think about it a great deal. Very interestingly, my first religious experience happened when I was about 13 years old. Uh, I was in a car with my parents. I remember it very vividly to this day. And I glanced out the window as we were driving down the highway and I saw a huge billboard sign. And on, the, on it was a, was a picture of Christ crucified. Mm. And there was a caption on the top of it that read, dare to be a priest like me. Now, I'm, I'm, I think I was about 13 years old. I could not have told you who Jesus was or why he was any different than any other religious leader or founder of a religion. I was very, very ignorant of uh, matters religious and had never had any kind of religious experience. But I gazed at it and something pierced me. Mm. I mean, pierced me deeply and it left me sort of uh, motionless and uh, I don't know if the word stunned would be the right word, but mm. deeply captured for just a moment. I had no category for this. I didn't know what to do with this. <laughs> and so I never told anyone. I never told my parents. Uh, I never mentioned it again and quickly sort of buried it somewhere in my subconscious and forgot about it, you know. But it came back in a very powerful <laughs> way about 10 years later. This is after I had converted and uh, had uh, been on youth, net youth ministries. I was back in university and I was wrestling with a vocation, you know. Every time I went to Mass, that host, when it was being lifted, was burning a hole in me. And I was wrestling and struggling. I mean, like every young man, I wanted marriage and family, you know. Uh, and I understood the cost that that would be, the sacrifice that that was. And uh, I, I had a moment at the cathedral in Victoria where I really made the surrender um, yeah. uh, in the sense that, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do, but you've got to make it crystal clear. <laughs> you've got to make it so clear that there's no way that I can doubt that it's you speaking to me. You know, uh, the ball's in your court, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to continue seeing this beautiful young lady I'm seeing. <laughs> I'm going to continue on unless you really speak into my life and... Wow, I didn't make it out of the church. I went to the back of the church and uh, opened up a copy of the BC Catholic magazine, and there was that same picture. Whoa! Dare to be a priest like me. Wow. From all those years earlier. So within a month, I was visiting a religious community. So. All right, our guest yeah. is Bishop Scott McKig. Well, I'm going to beg you to back up a little yes. bit, though, because we, we've just jumped <laughs> ahead and got you to, ready to that, but you mentioned that ministry and, and uh, all of that. So let's back up a bit. How did that ever happen? So there you are, I'm guessing, at least at that when you saw that first time, that billboard, you didn't even know who Jesus was. Not really. Uh, I mean, I knew it had something to do with God, and I knew He was a religious leader, and I know that some people were His followers. But beyond that, not much. Uh, so, you know, I... And probably oblivious to the, all the different different churches and Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, whatever is up in Canada. I mean, it's the United Church. Exactly. But the, exactly. Yeah. So I knew um, after my mother passed away when I was about 16 years old, I, I made connection with our Presbyterian pastor, who I later was to discover was sort of a closet Catholic, you know. <laughs> um, so I knew I was... Presbyterian or baptized Presbyterian. I knew that my grandfather was Anglican and that was in the background as well. I couldn't have told you the difference between the two. I had no idea. Um, graduated from high school uh, and then spent a year bumming around the Rockies, skiing and, uh, and partying and whatever 18-year-olds do when they get away from home for the first time. And and, uh, That's a great park. Was that Banff? Yeah, no. Banff. And I was actually in Lake Louise, oh, wow. but uh, just tremendous beauty and skiing and hiking and all of that. But it was during that time that I sort of the existential crisis hmm. began. You know, um, I was mixing with people of all sorts of faith and no faith. Uh, we'd have these intense discussions, you know, and uh, um, I, it, I began to really ask the question, do I believe in God or don't I? Mm. And, and I, I really consciously made the decision, I need to find out. I need to know. Because if this is just some big fairy tale, if this is just a big, you know, Santa Claus in the sky, I don't want anything to do with it. But if there really is a God, then I need to know and I need to get on board. I need to find out. You know, so um, I think one evening walking back from a pub in the middle of the evening, I fell into a snowbank and 
looked at the stars and uh, probably uttered my first honest prayer, which was, you know, something to the effect of, is anybody there? Are you there? You know, do you exist? And can you show me? I can't help but think about the, that first chapter in Romans where Paul says that the evidence of God is out there. Yeah. He, he, we have no excuse. He's there. And I can't think of the place where he awakened you was in that beauty. I think something happened. Something definitely happened. I think it was also the experience of getting everything I thought I wanted. Freedom, skiing, you know, the party lifestyle, all of that. And it, it wore off pretty quick. I realized that my heart was aching for something more. I wanted more. This just wasn't enough. And uh, it wears off. And I looked around and I saw people in their 40s that had done the same thing I did, come to the Rockies and when they're 18, and they're still there doing the same thing. And I think something deep inside said, there's more. You know, there was a, there was a call. I didn't recognize it yet, but it was there. Yeah. So the Rocky Mountain high doesn't stay high the whole <laughs> no, it time. Doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't. It wears <laughs> off. The next year I went back to, uh, back to my hometown, which was interior British Columbia, Kamloops, and they had a community college there, and I started taking courses. And um, uh, interestingly, this is another one of the Lord's uh, secret weapons. I started dating a very devout Catholic girl. Oops. Yep. <laughs> uh, who took her faith very seriously. And I was very impressed by the integrity of her faith. Mm. She had a couple of uncles who were priests, a couple of uh, aunts who were nuns. So it was a serious commitment to the faith, you know. But it stirred up all this existential questions. Mm. Uh, I would argue with her all the time and argue with members of her family and play the devil's advocate and ask the toughest questions I could think of. Um, but all the time I'm processing, grinding, uh, you know, trying to figure out you know, is this real or is this just mm. human ritual, you know? As it happened the next year, uh, we weren't seeing each other anymore because she had gone with one of her uncles who was a priest and her sister off to Europe to travel Europe mm. for a year. And so I was sort of free. Um, and that was the year that I decided I really needed to dig in deep. Mm. I dropped a few courses at college um, and I started to study. I started to do it on my own. I started to ask questions of pastors that I knew, of people who were devout Christians from various denominations. Mm -hmm. um, the first question, of course, is, is there a God? Mm -hmm. Does God really exist? And uh, I was coming across the arguments against God's existence, and I was completely unconvinced. It just, you know, uh, even at that early stage, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? And, it, it, you know, now I understand it's called the teleological argument, but I couldn't <laughs> understand how could something be in existence that wasn't brought into existence for a reason, for a purpose? How could there be this without something behind it? So I just found the arguments against God's existence to, to miss the mark. They didn't answer the questions that I was asking. And... Uh, so very quickly, I began to realize, yes, I do believe that there is a God. I do believe that the world came into being from an omnipotent creator who, um, who you know, but what does that look like? I have no idea. The second big question on my mind was, is Jesus who he claimed to be? Um, there's a lot of people who follow, you know, God in one, you know, uh, one form or another, or one understanding or another, but that are Christian. So it seemed to me it was pretty fundamental. Jesus was the only one that I was aware of who was claiming to be divine. That's, that's important. That's key. <laughs> and the arguments of C.S. Lewis gripped me, you know, um, yeah. li liar, lunatic, or Lord. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was an undergrad in history, so I knew how to... Uh, to research. I knew how to find the answers uh, that Jesus really did exist. Um, I was coming across really good arguments for the reliability, the historical reliability of Scripture, properly understood mm -hmm. in the, uh, the form that they were, catechisms of the early church, etc., but to tell the truth about what mm -hmm. Jesus said and did. Um, so it's coming together. It's slowly coming together. At the same time, I ran into stories like those of Fatima, and the apparitions of Our Lady at Fatima, Portugal, 1917. And 
and the, uh, the miracle of Fatima. 125,000 people saw this miracle at that place as promised months in advance. I was blown away. Uh, the miracle of Lourdes and, and the ongoing healings, uh, some of the prophecies from the great saints of the 19th century and or 18, 19th and uh, early 20th century. There's the stories about Padre Pio. I mean, I was shocked. And I remember thinking, why isn't this on the front page of every newspaper in the world? You know, this is not some God who's a theoretical being out somewhere swinging between two stars in a hammock. <laughs> this is a God who's very alive and active and involved in the world, in the unfolding of human history. So I was, I was uh, captured. I was fascinated. Um, I came to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. First of all, that he actually claimed it and that he was who he claimed to be. And I was seeing the evidence in all of these miracles and, and understanding them more deeply. The next big question I had, which, which is what brings me here, of course, <laughs> is, uh, well, okay, Jesus is who he claims to be, but there's something like, uh, somebody told me there's 30,000 denominations. 30,000 denominations. Where do, I find, where do I find Jesus in all of this? And uh, even at that point, I, I had friends from various streams of Christianity, if you will, evangelical friends, um, a few Catholic friends, a few that were classical Protestants, um, and they all had their reasons for believing what they believed, and I was asking them questions. And it was difficult because I admired them all. They were good people. They were convincing people, and they could all take the scriptures and back up what they believed in a convincing manner, especially for someone who didn't know the scriptures very well. Um, but I also saw they disagreed with each other on really, really important points. You know, is it enough to say Jesus is Lord, or is water baptism necessary for salvation? Is faith enough, or does faith need to produce fruit and works to bring about salvation? Is that a piece of bread, which is a mere symbol that gets passed around? Or should I put my knee on the ground because that is the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus? You know, I was thinking about, you mentioned the 30,000 denominations. And actually, that comes from a Protestant source mm. that makes that number, because I've heard some non-Catholics saying, well, there can't be that many. Well, the irony of why there are so many is that not only do these, these groups disagree on so many things, but they disagree on the very thing you're talking about, Jesus and who he was and what he claimed to be. And so it's not that we have 30,000 big denominations. We've got thousands of these individual churches yeah. that, have, that want no connections with anybody else. They're their own entity here in the way they believe. And it doesn't matter whether they disagree with the church on the corner over there. We've got it right. Yeah. And they're proliferating a new one every five days. But they're dealing with the exact questions you were dealing with at that point. Yeah. And I was reading, you know, a, a lot. I mean, I was really taking the time to study the scriptures. And I'm reading one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Why all these denominations? And they yeah. can't appear to agree on the most fundamental doctrines. What is necessary for salvation? Never mind some of the secondary doctrines, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it was very disconcerting and very difficult. And, you know, I'm reading the, the promise that the Holy Spirit will guide us into the fullness of truth. And uh, I'm not seeing that in all these divisions in Christianity. But I did notice one thing eventually. Uh, first of all, I was somewhat predisposed towards Catholicism because I'm seeing the lives of the saints and these miraculous stories and these apparitions of Our Lady with such powerful signs of God's presence, theophanies even, you know? It's, and you were seeing it in that family that you uh, had met. Yes, exactly. I was seeing authentic faith being lived out. Yeah. So I was disposed to, to take Catholicism seriously, uh, but I didn't want to discount these other traditions. And I felt a bit of a loyalty to my ancestors, if you will, you know, not knowing that they had originally been Catholic, right? Um, <laughs> But yeah, like, how do, I find, how do I find the truth in this? But as I say, I eventually noticed that in one way or another, they were all claiming the same thing, which was, we are being faithful, and our doctrine is faithful to what the earliest Christians believed, and all of these other groups have somehow gotten away from that. You know, so the Catholics made up all this, this stuff about the real presence, and 
you know, the communion of saints and all that later, and the, you know, the uh, classical Protestants lost it here, and the, you know, everybody had their story saying how everybody else went off, but they were being faithful to the early church. They were being faithful to what the first Christians believed and practiced. Well, now I'm an undergrad in history. That's like throwing, you know, raw meat in front of a guard dog. I needed to find out what the early church believed. Everybody had their own interpretations of how to understand the scriptures, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul and the other uh, epistles. They've all got their interpretations. How did the early church understand these texts? What did they believe? Now, I've, I've spent the last, you know, ever since that, that time reading the church fathers, it's one of my, one of my great loves. Uh, at that time, I had a very sparse understanding, but I was coming across quotes of Ignatius of Antioch and Clement of Rome and Polycarp and Irenaeus, uh, these great pillars of the early church who learned the faith in the apostolic times. In fact, knew the apostles, you know, um, and learned the faith from the apostles and those whom the apostles taught. So we have authentic Christianity at its source here. That, that in itself, for non-Catholic Christians, when they realize just the very thing you're talking about is a true awakening. We have our Lord and we have his apostles. And most non-Catholic Christians think, well, that's it. That's, it ended there. Yeah. But they taught men who wrote. Yeah. Who taught men who wrote. And we have their yeah. writings. Yeah. I mean, that is really an eye-opener when you first recognize the, 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 uh, the significance of that. Yeah. For our and it's people. exactly what I needed. It's exactly what I was looking for. And of course, as you read the, the uh, Apostolic Fathers, what was I seeing? Uh, bishops, Episcopoi, deacons, diaconi, priests, presbyteroi, the, the three levels of holy orders very clearly there. Um, Ignatius of Antioch making it very clear what the hierarchy was and understanding in the, in the, in the early church. Uh, this is somebody who learned or at least heard the preaching of the apostle St. John, you know, um, that the, not only was, was there bishops, priests, and deacons, but the notion of apostolic succession, that one had to be ordained by a bishop in the line from the apostles. It's there. Wow. The, uh, the Petrine ministry is already there, at least in its seminal yeah. form. Clement of Rome using the royal we to declare on matters outside of his diocese. And clearly is uh, Rome, uh, the, the church in Rome is spoken of as presiding in charity over the other churches. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, what I'm seeing here is extremely convincing. The, uh, the Eucharist as the, the same flesh that hung on the cross is now sacramentally present in mystery in the Eucharist. Real presence, the issue of authority, which was huge for me, being settled, uh, apostolic succession and the role of the Petrine ministry. Very quickly, you can see references to prayers at the tombs of the martyrs, you know, so the intercession of the saints is there. Um, I quickly was uh, you know, understood that uh, there was early references to praying for the dead, you know, so there was some sense of this purification after death. Eventually, what I, what I had to conclude is the early church was the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, it was, I, I have no choice. I, I need, I need, I need this. Uh, I began to hunger for the Eucharist. I started to read John 6 in a whole new light. And... Um, and I wanted that. I wanted that so badly. So really before Christmas in 1986, I knew. I knew that it was true. Um, <laughs> and I knew where I needed to be. And so I, uh, I signed up for RCIA. And that, that started the ball rolling. You know, I think about the power of the early church fathers. I'm assuming this is probably true. But in that time, you mentioned the, many of the usual suspects. During that time, did you come across the Didache at that time in your life? It was a little bit later that I came across the Didache. Uh, but I mean, it just, once again, it just yeah. confirmed well, everything that I was... Uh, the, the reason I bring up the Didache, which is, again, another one that, again, we're talking to an audience that so we hope they get out there and read those early oh, yeah. church fathers. And one of the, 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 the reasons I have really come to love the Didache is because, you know, potentially one of the earliest writings alongside the New Testament. But 
it, there you have the summary because it begins with there's two ways. Mm -hmm. You either follow God or there's the other. There's two ways. Yeah. And how do you do that? It's got bishops, priests, deacons, baptism, and the Eucharist and liturgy all in one yeah. document. Yeah. And like, as you said, that isn't Presbyterianism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was very compelling, very convincing. And yeah, so I signed up for RCA. I, I remember um, I drove the poor priest crazy. <laughs> In fact, he started meeting with me personally, aside from the group, because I was asking questions about, you know, the nature of the Trinity changing at the incarnation. And what did this mean? And what did that mean? And he's trying to give basic instruction to people who are, uh, you know, you know, haven't really taken the time or had the opportunity to study or to understand the faith very, very deeply, you know. So, uh, would you say, looking back, that your RCA experience was a good one? It was a very good one. I think it provided me not just answers to questions that I had, but it, it was an entry point into mm -hmm. the customs and the culture of the faith. Because it's more than just book knowledge, it's more than just understanding the scriptures and believing it with the head. There's a culture that surrounds it. There's, there's a way of understanding the life. There was liturgy. I remember the first time I got dragged to Mass, it was earlier on, with this girlfriend at the time, in fact, and I was utterly lost. I was stand, sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel. I remember thinking to myself, this is the Pope's version of a Jane Fonda workout, you know. <laughs> One moment people are trying to hug me and I don't know what's happening and then they want my money. And I, I was lost. I was completely lost. And there was a man up there with a pointy hat. I didn't understand any of the symbols. I didn't understand what was happening, the movement, the rhythm of the liturgy. Um, it, that takes time. Yeah. And in addition to imparting knowledge of the faith, the basic catechesis, uh, I had a very good RCIA team that that uh, was working with us, and they really helped me to understand all of this and to in, enculturate. All right. Well, we're going to pause there, uh, Your Excellency. And for those of you watching, I want to remind you, if I, if I can, of the my work with CH Network, Coming Home Network, and we have a website, chnetwork.org. Maybe after the break, I'm going to talk to the bishop about this because there are many people that seem to be fighting against the faith. Mm. Maybe some of you, are, you know people fighting against the faith, but may not realize that behind that battle is an awakening happening. Mm. That's what was, it kind of sounded like what was happening to you when you were fighting with that Catholic family, all the questions, but something was going on inside, yeah. which is a reminder to not give up, is that how can we help work with people on the journey that seem to be just fighting everything you said. Well, we don't give up. That's why Bishop is here to say, hey, if he can come in. Anybody. Anybody can come. Can come. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to the chnetwork.org website, you'll find lots of other conversion stories as well as resources to help you on your journey. And we'll be back in a moment with more of Bishop McCaig's story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Bishop Scott McCaig. And uh, I, let's see, where did I rudely interrupt you? You had just gotten through RCIA, and uh, you know, a lot of people, they get almost to the altar, then they back away hmm. a little bit. Uh, uh, I remember G.K. Chesterton talked about that, about the, the journey of conversion is when you give the Catholic Church a little room, then you're in trouble, and then you all of a sudden, <laughs> Uh, you're on your way, and then it's like, whoa. Yeah. And uh, so talk about your actual entrance into the church. Yeah, I never experienced that. I was so hungry to, to get going and to dive in. I was, uh, I was fascinated and captured by Jesus. I was reading the scriptures. Uh, I was just, I was like a starving child. I was hungry, you know, <laughs> and I uh, learned how to pray the rosary and developed a very strong Marian devotion very early. And... Um, uh, I, I remember uh, in preparing for my confirmation, uh, 
my first confession, you know, having to go in and you're a little, don't know what to make of it, you know, and uh, it was an absolutely magnificent experience. I, I just sat there and I made a good examination of conscience. It was really a lifetime confession, you know, I was only 21 years old, but, you know, I had never really lived a life of faith and so there was, there was things to mention. And I poured out my soul and uh, the priest basically, you know, quoted from, John, uh, from uh, Luke chapter 15, you know, welcome home, <laughs> welcome home. And I was so deeply, deeply moved and the mercy of God's love was so tangent and personal for me at that time. It was powerful. So it was Easter, Easter Vigil, 1987, April 18th, that uh, I was confirmed, received communion for the first time. And uh, was there again the next morning as quick as I could be to, uh, to go again <laughs> for Easter Masses. Uh, Were you at that time still a history student, assuming that's the direction you would go? Yes, I was still studying at that local college, which is now a university, but at the time it was a transfer, uh, transfer college. Um, I think still very much on that track, yeah. you know. I'm not sure what I was going to do with it, but I knew the love of history was, uh, was going to be a part of it somewhere. Did your girlfriend come back from Europe finding you a Catholic? Well, that was, that came, a, yes, exactly. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> and I did assume that that was going to be a big part of my life as well. Um, but yeah, so I was received into the church. It was an amazing experience. And it's funny, you know, long before I was even a Catholic, they'd asked me to, uh, to lead the youth group youth, young adults group at huh. the cathedral parish in Kamloops, you know. Uh, I, myself and a close friend who had come into the church the year before, and, uh, and his wife, who was a, was a strong Catholic. So it was, it was, I mean, it was hilarious. I was taking everything I was learning in RCIA and then coming back and teaching <laughs> the young people, you know. Um, but I brought them about two weeks after my confirmation to a net retreat. So the, the, uh, the national evangelization teams uh -huh. uh, based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, a friend of mine also from high school I discovered had gone on the road and was a member of these teams. Mm. And uh, I took the youth group to their retreat and was blown away by these young people my age, full of faith and fire. And uh, I was very, very mm. captured by them as well. They invited me to their team prayer. And so I went with them. And of course, it was in a very charismatic style. Now, I had had some understanding of the charismatic renewal because I had read the book of Acts. Uh, I understood this was a current of grace released into the church that the modern popes, um, you know, Paul VI and John Paul II had really said, this is a move of God. Mm -hmm. So I was open to it. But the expression was just not where I was at. You know, they had their hands in the air and they were singing freely from their hearts to God. And I have to admit it was capturing. It was beautiful, you know. And uh, I had my hands about like this, and I'm saying our fathers <laughs> and Hail Marys and trying not to get noticed. And without anybody laying a hand on me, I really had an encounter with the living Christ. Uh, what they now, what I, you know, came to understand is called the baptism in the Holy Spirit experience, you know. And uh, it just took everything that I had been learning, everything that I had been studying, and just poof, brought it right to there, brought it right to my heart. Um, the ache that I had experienced for an encounter with God, mm. the ache for infinite truth and infinite beauty and infinite goodness, I was experiencing it. And uh, it was just so life-changing. It was a watershed moment mm. in my life. Mm. From that moment on, I've, I, I just, there's just no going back. Yeah. Yeah. I've tasted who God is and I've seen, and there's just, there's no going back from there. Hmm. Very powerful experience. Well, wow. which reminds me of that scripture in Hebrews 6, where it talks about how hard it is to bring somebody back if they've tasted that. Yeah. And then walked away. And then walked away. Yeah. It, it, it's hard. He says it's impossible. Nothing's yeah. impossible with God, of course, but from our perspective, yeah. it is once you've tasted it. So it isn't a guarantee. That's right. But it's a great, powerful mm -hmm. gift of grace that gives you the energy, the, you know, the spiritual energy to move forward and, and be of use for the Lord. Yeah, and I mean, we understand and know from, from theology and from the catechism of the Catholic Church that the Holy Spirit's number one job is to reveal Jesus to the spirit of the person. So I had accepted him rationally. 
I knew he rose from the dead. I believed it. I understood that he was the living and reigning Lord of the universe. I had seen him work miracles. I knew he was in the Eucharist. But there was something that happened for me that revealed him not just as all of that, but as my Lord, as my Savior, as the King of my life, you know. Uh, I saw him with new eyes. I saw, as St. Paul would say, I saw the glory of God shining on his human face. There was a revelation, a deep revelation of who he was to me. And uh, that, like I say, it was a watershed moment. Nothing changes after that. I mean, nothing, you can't go back. At least I couldn't go back. Um, I very quickly applied to Net Youth Ministries because I wanted more of this. (laughs) And uh, uh, I I was accepted for the fall of 1987. I later found out that they usually ask you to wait about three years after becoming a Catholic before you go on the road, you know. Um, but the team that was doing the selection felt very prompted in their own prayer to let me on the road. And that became a, an amazing formative experience. I learned from them a deep, deep love of the church. I learned from them how to develop a, you know, a, an ordered life of personal prayer. Hmm. I learned from them a deeper love of the rosary and of the traditions of the church. Uh, I learned fraternity. I learned what it meant to to be in a band of brothers, you know, Mm. people really sharing their lives together as as Net has these men's groups where you meet every week with these other men on your team and share your life. And boy, that was such a Mm. powerful force. Um, And evangelization. I developed a heart. I developed a heart for seeing people come alive and understand and experience what Mm. I had experienced. Um, So that, that grew in my heart. So it was an amazing experience. Wow. Was it down um, in the States or were you doing Yeah, something? there was only Net USA at that okay. time. All right. Okay. Net Canada formed about four or five years later right. and then it expanded from there. Oh. But uh, I've often said that I think every single uh, Catholic who takes their faith seriously should do, you know, a, a year between high school and going to university. Go do it for a year. The, oh. the training is amazing. It's a, it's a beautiful ministry. Hey, if it works for the Mormons, we ought to do it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about it. They commit themselves to two years. I mean, why aren't we doing that? And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Absolutely amazing. During that year, the, the, the call, the struggle with the priesthood had begun in earnest, but I was rejecting it. I didn't want to look at it. That young lady was still in the picture. And uh, it was the next year that I went back to university, uh, in this time in Victoria. She was in Vancouver, studying at the University of British Columbia. We we're seeing each other on the weekends and that kind of thing. And I'm wrestling with the vocation. And uh, that all came to a head in the story I told at the, uh, at the opening of the show. And Yeah, you, I mean, you were experiencing the fact that you, you didn't have to be a priest to have a vibrant ministry. That's right. And you fact, knew was, that to be true. It yeah. was part of my prayer that day at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Victoria. It's like, Lord, I believe that you're calling. Uh, I'm, I'm willing now to acknowledge it. But I also know that I can still be a saint as a layman. Mm-hmm. And so, thanks. <laughs> but no thanks. But I left the door open that much. You know, if you really want this for me, and if this would be a mistake for me not to say yes to you, then you've got to speak to me. You know, and I don't mean, you know, someone coming up to me at a prayer meeting and saying you should be a priest because they say that to every young unmarried man, you know. Um, I need to hear from you in a way that I'll understand. And that moment was a game changer. But it wasn't just that incident, you know, like years later, I learned about St. Ignatius of Loyola and the discernment of spirits, uh, the hard consolations of, you know, what is uh, that it speaks the truth that there's there's a clarity in it. You understand the vocation. It makes sense to you. There's courage. Something comes alive inside of you. And so what if I have to do five years of seminary? So what? You know, and, uh, yeah. uh, and a deep peace. So even at, at an emotional level, it was turmoil. Deep yeah. down somewhere, there was a, an aha, you know. Yeah. So it was a deep confirmation. And from there on, there we go. Yeah, asking God for what's your will is it, yeah. is is the right question, but it, it's an answer that doesn't always come easily, yeah. and it takes time, which is what the five years at seminary are about. Exactly, is the con- confirmation of that. Yeah, right. Precisely. 
So, all right, so you're, 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 uh, your beckoning is confirmed, and you survived the five years. <laughs> I did. Talk about becoming a priest. I was ordained in 1995. On June 3rd, the Feast of Charles Luanga and Companions, the African oh. Martyrs, uh -huh. not having any idea the, the role that the church in Africa would play in my priesthood. Um, I served one year as an associate pastor. I did another year as a hospital chaplain and helping in formation in my community. Uh, I spent two years as a young pastor in a uh, kind of a, a rural parish, um, learning the ropes. I was given some time by my community between assignments to spend some time with the CFR community down in New York, Benedict oh, wow. Rochelle and, and, wow, wow, and Bunch, wow. you know. Um, I came back and then I was elected to our executive council and the new director of, or the new uh, general superior appointed me the, to be the director of formation. And so I did that for six years. Initially, I was supposed to go to Rome to study, but this was more important. <laughs> and it was the duty of the moment. We had to develop a novitiate, develop a full formation program. So myself and a few other priests did that. This whole time, we're writing our constitutions as a community because we're mm. a young community mm. uh, looking for approval from Rome to become a society of apostolic life. So there was a lot going on. I you know? I know that I <clears throat> met your founder during yeah. that period, the yeah. mid '90s. I can't remember. I can remember sitting with him in an airport. At some point, we're going to Europe together. I can't remember, Bob, you know, Bob Bedard, and uh, but that, I can't remember much about him. <laughs> Wonderful man of God. Just a tremendous, yeah. tremendous, one of the kindest and gentlest human beings I've ever known in my life. There was, a, a, I think, a charism that came through him. Mm -hmm. People experienced the Father's unconditional love through his ministry. Mm -hmm. He was a man. He could light you up in the pulpit. He could <laughs> crawl right under your skin, and, you know, I'd follow that man into a fire. Um, and you ended up in Africa, right, for a while? Yeah, so I was made director of formation, and... Uh, our whole community was devoted to the new evangelization as right. envisioned by John Paul the Great. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted these young men to get experience of evangelization even outside our culture. So I approached Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck with uh, Renewal Ministries and, and said, uh, I'd like my seminarians to accompany hmm. on these mission trips and learn the ropes and bump elbows with seasoned Catholic evangeliz evangelists, you know. Yeah. And they said, that's great. We'd love to help you. We'd love to have it. But one condition, you got to go first. <laughs> so <laughs> I went on a few trips to Uganda and to Tanzania, and I was hooked. Yeah. I fell in love with the people of Africa. I fell in love with the mission of proclamation, initial proclamation of the gospel. Um, I, just, I just soaked it up. And so over the years, I've done about 15 or 16 different missions in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, and practically all over Africa, so. Now, so how did you get the next step? Well, in 2006, I was elected General Superior of our society. I served one term till 2012, was re-elected in 2012, and uh, was getting close to finishing my second term. I was four years into a six-year term, and I got a phone call from the Papal Nuncio. Uh, and this wasn't unusual because we had spoken before and he had uh, brought me in and asked me questions before about certain events going on in the church and uh, um, asking for names of potentially, you know, good candidates for the episcopacy. So I assume that it was this and uh, mm. it happened to be the Feast of Divine Mercy during the Jubilee of Divine Mercy and he asked if I was going to a celebration of the, of the Divine Mercy at 3 o'clock in a particular parish, one of our companion's parishes. I said, yes, I'm going to hear confessions. And he said, nonchalantly, great, I'll meet you there. I, you know, I just, I need to ask you a question. No problem. Uh, so afterwards, he grabs me by the elbow, puts me in a corner, and starts telling me, you know, the military ordinary of Canada needs a bishop. Uh, the previous bishop was, resign was um, stepping down. He had reached 70 and was having some health problems, and so he was retiring. <clears throat> and he starts talking about the qualifications necessary, some of the ins and outs of the, of the uh, position. And in my head, I'm formulating a list. Who do I know, good, strong priests, orthodox, you know, obviously they're going to have to have a missionary spirit, 
who have served in the military, or at least in the reserves, who have some military experience. Obviously, Canada is bilingual, so they're going to need to know French. So I've got a short list. I had two or three names on that little short list in my head. And then to my absolute amazement and shock, uh, the, uh, the Archbishop turned to me and said, and, um, you know, the Holy Father has appointed you. And then he just <laughs> continues talking. <laughs> And I was so stunned that I wasn't sure I heard him correctly. So I didn't say anything, and I just waited. And about two sentences further on, he says, of course, this presumes that you accept. You accept, don't you? At that moment, uh, I had lots of objections in my own heart. I, I'm not worthy. I, uh, this is an honor that uh, I just can't even imagine. As well as practically, I've never served in the military, and um, I, I don't even have rudimentary French. So I have these <laughs> objections to raise, but what kept going through my mind was the, uh, the, the words of our founder in my community, Father Bob Bedard, who commenting on Our Lady would always say, the word that the Lord wants to hear from you is yes. Say yes to the Lord, even when you don't know what it's going to mean. Trust Him. Say yes. <laughs> so I took this invitation as a sign of divine providence. I said yes. Then I objected that I don't, <laughs> I don't know any French and I, uh, I've never been in the military. And he says, you'll get to know the military and your French lessons start tomorrow. <laughs> so that's how it happened. So you have a kind of a big diocese. I have a huge diocese. I think when I met Cardinal Ouellette the first time in Rome, uh, he said, Scott, you know, you have the second largest geographical nation in the world with, co with base from coast to coast to a coast and to coast in the Northwest Territories. Plus, Canada is very high on the list of nations doing, you know, uh, deployments overseas militarily. He said, you know, I think next to the Holy Father, you might just have the biggest territory in the world. But you don't have to do it yourself, right? I'm no. assuming you have chaplains under A you. A wonderful, right? wonderful corps of chaplains, priests, deacons, and lay pastoral associates as well. So. Okay, I have you here. It's just you and me. No one else is listening. So I thought I'd love to get your... your thoughts as a bishop mm. connected with other bishops around the world um, the state of things mm. you know I think a lot of of us we we hear what's happening in the church through the media and often the media isn't very kind to the church even isn't always very kind with the facts yeah so but there seems to be uh, you talked about the time in the 80s and the 90s when there was a great high with the charismatic renewal, the Marian movements, uh, conversions, a lot of hope. Mm. I think especially under St. John Paul II. There, there, but things, there's an awful lot of chaos. I notice it when we, even in, in the, the simple ways of trying to do fundraising. Yeah. You know, things have changed. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Brown? I really passionately believe that we have to have a biblical worldview. You know, and we have to understand, yes, things are very difficult right now. Things are painful. We've gone through some terrible crises. crises. There's confusion. There's, there's difficulties everywhere we turn. But let's get a biblical perspective. What, was, what were the consequences of the fall? You know, we fell away. We were alienated from God. That is healed you know, through, mm. through justification, through baptism and faith. Um, our human nature was wounded, not totally corrupt, but wounded deeply through the fall. Our intellects are darkened, our, con our wills are inclined to evil. We call concupiscence. Our passions are in disarray, setting, pulling together towards what we're made for. They pull in different directions. Mm. And that is healed through a process of sanctification that takes a lifetime. We sometimes forget the third is that this world came under the dominion of the evil one. Mm. Jesus himself calls him the prince of this world. St. Paul calls him the lord of the air, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a reality. There is a kingdom of darkness which hangs over this world. And the biblical story, the revelation of God, is that we're living in the midst of the clash of kingdoms. Yeah. The kingdom of God is invading and smashing into and crashing into the kingdom of this fallen world. Now, what happens when you get a high-pressure system in weather slamming into a low-pressure system in weather? You get storms. And the greater the difference, the more violent the storms. Well, we're living through storms. 
And you know what? We never have not been living through storms. People forget that one of the 12 was lost. There's divisions in the early church. Read the epistles of St. Paul. What was going on in Corinth? Two things stand side by side. Immense holiness on the one hand, but also corruption and sin and division. Those two things together. What do we see in the life of St. Paul? Well, we see immense holiness and healings and beauty, but we also see the struggles. You know, the, the break with Barnabas over John Mark and so many of these things. And in fact, if you read church history carefully, there has never been a time when these two realities do not stand side by side. On the one hand, corruption, division, heresy, struggle. On the other hand, great saints raised up to speak for God in the times, you know. Um, I, I, I often say to people, in the darkest moment of a storm, you'll get a, a flash of lightning and it lights everything up. Mm. These are the saints. In dark times, they show us the truth, yeah. right? So yes, we live in difficult times, but it's not unusual. It's not unusual in the history of the church. And the point I think I need to make is, where do the greatest saints and the most saints come from? The periods that are darkest and most stormy in the church's history. Now is not a time to be complaining. Now is a time to step, step up and be the lightning. It's a time to step up and be the saints we're called to be. Who are the reformers of the church? Not people who criticize on the internet. It's the saints of the reformers of the yeah, church. It, I, I feel like I repeat myself on this program uh, because I'm pretty sure I've said some of this on, one of, on the recent Journey Homes, but um, you know, we, we talk about the fullness of the church subsists in the Catholic Church, and we believe that to be true. And, uh, but sometimes I think it, it, the, the fullness isn't so much the hierarchy and the structures and all that, it's that thread of holiness that we see in the saints all the way yes. through. When, when the church went through a horrendous time in the second, third, fourth century, we have a St. Anthony. In the fifth centuries, when the Rome is at, at, at the end, we have a St. Benedict. Yeah. You know, in the, in the 10th, 11th century, we have St. Francis and, and Dominic. We have these great yeah. leaders and saints. God is always going to raise up the saints that we need in our times. You know, there's um, something St. John Paul the Great said in 1998 on the Vigil of Pentecost. He said, the institutional and charismatic aspects, as it were, are both necessary in the life of the faith. The analogy that I like to use, if you think of a very powerful river, there's two elements that are necessary. One is you need the power in the river. You need the water. Because if you don't have the water, what you got is a ditch, right? <laughs> so if you have the institution without the power of the Holy Spirit working in people and saints being raised up, you've got a ditch. But at the same time, if you've got powerful water, but you don't have you know, the, the, the banks to guide it, you got floods. It causes more damage than good. Well, that's the institutional nature of the church. That is the hierarchy that is by God's design in the church. And the two must function together. Um, we need them both. We need the hierarchy. Yeah. We need the institution of the church. But we also need people to surrender their lives to the grace of Jesus in, in, a, in a powerful way and become the saints that we're all called to be. Yeah. Uh and sometimes the hierarchy has to put a dam in that big river. Yeah. You know what I mean? See, it has got to take responsibility that the Spirit's yeah. given to make sure that water is, yeah. is controlled so it doesn't overwhelm the... Yeah. So sometimes it has to... to and moves it in the, in the right direction and helps discern the direction. Yeah. Your Excellency, I, I, we've run out of time. Uh, <laughs> I want you to close us with the... Because there's so much more I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, hopefully we'll have you back sometime. That would be awesome. But I would love to, if you could close us with a, a benediction. If you would, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we do thank you for this time together. And we ask that you open all of our hearts to the splendor of your truth and into a deeper living relationship with you through the charisms, through the sacraments, through the gift of your Holy Church. And I do pray for all who are watching this program and I impart to them uh, this Episcopal blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a great yeah. privilege to have you here. Thank you. It's your, your work around the world and, and what you're ah, doing. Thank well, you we're trying. That. We're and, trying. Uh, uh, and, and hopefully we'll stay in contact. 
Okay, I hope so. And thank you for joining us on this program. I hope uh, Bishop McKeg's um, story, as well as his blessing and his encouragement, is an encouragement to you. God bless you.